Morning, everyone. And for the first time in a while, welcome to the darkest timeline. Hope you've got your cups of, uh... Oh, shit, I knew something was wrong. Yeah, leave it to us to do the whole show concept based on a shitty D&D and coffee joke. Not even half coffee half of the time. Welcome to the Cup of Homebrew. And today, I want to take a minute. Just have a fucking break from all of this. Jesus fucking Christ. No. I want to take a minute to talk to everyone about immersion. And it feels... Half of it feels soliloquous, right? Why even take a moment of our time to even acknowledge the fact that, yes, our favorite hobby is great when we can imagine all of it, or most of it, or some of it. Feels like a filler episode, doesn't it? It is. But, nonetheless, I feel like it's an important part of the conversation that we've never had uh, fully, that we haven't explored an avenue which completes and seals off our favorite hobby and uh, our more remarkable games. Those that we remember years on. Because moments we build up and are able to experience without or at least with the thinning of this player character barrier. That I know we feel a lot of the time. Right? There's this logical and, let's say, perceptional barrier and between us, the players, and our fictional avatars, the ones that are actually experiencing face-first the universes that which we describe and that we live in and we thrive in. Is my microphone on? Yeah, okay. If I haven't let go of the music, it's a bit more uncanny for me to hope that I'm not doing a complete ass out of myself. But that remains to be seen. <laughs> Saying that today or the past week or so hasn't been a good while for science and for the creative medium and for the me bitching and moaning about how life is weird it is an understatement, at least in my part. But nonetheless, here we are. So let's establish a timeline, shall we? Like we try to do in every episode, let's set some ground rules. Set this sort of a... Maybe I should do this here. You're right, so you can, like, imagine that my hand actually has letters next to it. And if I ever do manage to edit for YouTube. <laughs> it's going to also display what we want to talk about today. So today, we're going to talk about immersion in your, not even in only D&D games, in role-playing in general. <laughs> Why? It's such an important, and often I feel like it's overlooked, especially with groups that don't have the overview of maybe wanting to do a deep, immersive dive into their own universes because they already feel at home. Pinpoint what's missing on a lot of the... Hey, some of you have left already, okay. Pinpoint what's missing in some overly technical groups. Pinpoint how overly relying on immersion is sometimes a bad thing. I'm not going to do pros and cons that much, though. We're not going to do pros and cons. Because overall, we can pretty much agree that being immersed and being invested in the time you spend at the table be it behind the screen or in front of the challenges. 
it's overall overwhelmingly. I mean, you, we can't really state anything else other than it's a good thing overall. Being immersed and invested in your games is a great fucking deal. I just lost advertising money. It's confusing. I'm confused. I've been doing this for a year. I still have no idea how to conduct myself. Maybe that's the charm of why we aren't able to grow. <laughs> anyway. It's going to be a very rambly episode. I'm, I'm sure you've noticed. For the people upon YouTube. I'm trying to... You guys are not an afterthought. I am a slob. Moving on from my inadequacies. Hey, thanks for the... Th that one. The, this. The, the. Ah! I even wanted the category for today to be, like, talk shows or chatting. That's how much of an idiot I am. <laughs> Nonetheless, let's move on. So, arguably, yeah, you're right. It is, it is. Moving on. Just, mm. <laughs> okay. So, discussing the immersive part of our favorite hobby is a stupid looking rabbit hole because arguably we shouldn't even be doing it. This is the patch at the end of the day. You should be immersed in your games as much as you want like, are comfortable with, <laughs> and feel accustomed to. So maybe the first part of the conversation is arguably for the people who feel that they are not. Maybe you should also establish ways that you can connect and feel established. <laughs> Immersed, not established. I'm a fucking mess. Alright. Immersed. We feel connected. Connected. Fucking. Ugh. To your worlds. And I feel like the first part of this conversation is not on the shoulders of the people facing the challenge. Not entirely the part of the people in front of the screen. It is our fellows, Dungeon Masters. Job. Job. Prerequisite. Nah. Hopeful. Attribution. Yeah. I like this one. I'm not a lock with this. Oh, well. So it is our jobs as DMs. Try to bring people into our headspace, right? <laughs> Because the, the better we manage to present to the people at the table what's going on in here, the better they'll be along for our journey with us. Or arguably, the better we'll be along for a shared journey. Because it's clear that, or at least I don't know my limited worldview. For me, I'm of the opinion that it's not DMs pulling players into their personal headspace. It's the definitions from both sides of the table, right? Coming together and sharing a sort of an Im imaginarium that's being created together, right? The DMs bring forth the general feeling, the environment, the slices of life that we're going to talk about in a minute. The, let's say, all-encompassing glove of reality that's handling the players and presenting them into this world and trying to find a good spot for everyone to coexist, to coalesce. But at the same time, if this symbiosis is 
not only to last, but to exist in the first place. It is the player's... Hmm? Oh, no. You know, I do a habit of throwing my phone away in the most distant corner of the room every time we start this show. And then I start getting notifications. Kids. And fellow adults. I'm sorry. For my ideas. <laughs> anyway. So. What I'm saying. Is that. First of all. When constructing. And. Beginning to detail. The world that we're about to describe. To our players. We should think. Of how they. Initially. Through their character's creation and self-definition want or can fit into this world. Where are the nooks and crannies, the niches, the parts of our universe or the blank spaces that we've left, intentionally or not, for players to experience, for players to be able to jump in and claim that spot as their own, not necessarily as a physical place, but as an environment that they can visualize easiest. Now, of course, this can be done for a group or for players as individuals. And let's talk about that. So, you create a world. Define it as good as you can. Or as completely as you can. As, as you see fit, right? And when you're done creating this world, you present your fresh new baby to your players and say, okay, Here's our playpen. Here's our sandbox. Here's our stage. No matter how you think you want to delve into this narratively um, and exploratively, right? As far as information flow goes, you present to them as what of a slice of life as you can before the campaign even starts. Here is the world. And then, together, even though a lot of DMs go on extremes of this spectrum, right? You can make anything. Or, there's the other DMs that uh, restrict a lot of races, classes, subclasses, even feats, right? I feel like there should be a balance between these. The reasonable idea of your world feeling complete, connects, right? The mathematical term connects and populated. So the first step is to work with your players and find with them concepts that fit into this presentation. While, of course, allowing them to customize as much as they can and want within reason, right? this whole complete imaginary about their characters. At the end of this step of the process, and it's strange because we were talking about immersion, now we're talking about how to start a campaign. But I feel like with the right start and the right definitions and the right types of communications meeting halfways or wherever along this line you might, in this spectrum you might, in the, how do you define? How do you even? Meeting at close points in imaginary perception. Shit, I want to pat myself on the back for that. But... So the status quo right now is this. You've made your world, presented it to your players, and they've found their nooks and crannies where they want to start exploring, right? Say you have someone who's really interested in an internal faction of your universe. And you allow some of that into their background. Say you have someone who's really invested in some custom timidity doodah of a subclass or a feat or a subrace or a racial origin, what have you, that you've made for your world, or religion, but to whatever, any detail that they grasp on and make it part of their own. 
definition, self-definition. It's really important because we're talking about one of the most purest forms of self-expression. A ground-up definition of a new id and ego, which is arguably, if you take a step back and analyze this for a second, uh, if it's a behavioral pattern, if it's a psychological liberty do it is fucking huge. Because together with some people, you have managed to establish new worldviews and perceptions. Now, of course, to each their own, right? As much or little you want to dwell on the process of character creation and integration, it is entirely up to you and your player's comfort level. Because we've all seen amazing backstories that lead nowhere, and really simple characters that steal the show. Arguably, that's all about, you know, the right kind of players and player characters and fit. But let's take it to a more base level. It is about the comfort and comfort in perceiving what everyone puts forward. That's great. Up until this step, if, and again, it boils down to communication. Of course, it always boils down to talking about the right things the right way. By the way, this is my cup of coffee for today. I feel like we should shift our donation goals to just me buying a one of those small espresso machines. <sighs> right. So, we can finally put our best foot forward and uh, talk about the process of immersion. And there is a lot to tackle at first. At least, in my opinion, I'd want to see the group that we're talking about and get a bit into their headspace. So, first couples of episodes, or when you feel that you want to step up the submersion, the believability, or at least inhabitability, inhabitability. of your world, you should take a couple of steps back and see how players naturally perceive things, how they naturally interact with the setting, what draws their eye and ire. Because you can do immersion as a line of the shiny new toys and look, this is awesome, this is amazing, come explore this theme park of cool ideas that we both around the table, all of us around the table, consider fresh and new and cool. Or you can write a fine, albeit a bit controversially, an unstable line between comfort and intense discomfort. Tension, fear, Lack of information and let's call it fixed point perspectives have an effect on a lot of players. I'm still talking about the DM side of things. Because you can present a very minutely crafted environment. Case by case. Case in point, uh, I'm only talking about this because on Sunday, we have successfully, I, I hope I can say successfully, we started our main Sunday game in a different format. Things in our real life environment have 
clearly not normalized, and we're still under the effects of more and more and more things. Now, we here at Average Adventures don't really want to take uh, a step and throw ourselves too far into this. But the issues happening are maddening. 2020 has been a wallop of a year. And so at least for my table, I've decided to keep things online for a while. You know, the safety of our own homes and all that. And this is exactly why I feel like I had to talk about immersion because for the past couples of months, without realizing, the level of immersion that I've been able to, and I, I, I do hold this as very important for my games, for our games as a community. I want people to experience the intensity of things that I know they're capable of experience, to throw themselves into scenarios and headspaces that are maybe alien to their own, all right? To use this wonderful imagination that every D&D player at a base level possesses, because our game is all about the mindscape, the theory. Such a, such a beautiful idea. So I noticed that my immersion levels were going down. I could feel it, right? You feel the hum of, of people that are engaged with you on the same side of the viewing glass. It's a palpable, yet very hard to pin down feeling, right? So I took a step back, and let me tell you how we did this for our guys. So of course, we're beyond step one, right? Communication is a very big deal. And we did that a couple of times. We keep doing this every once in a while when we feel things are off. And I'm thankful for a very reasonable table. I will say this right now. I'm a very privileged DM. Because I don't have to deal with difficult people. And I, I'm a sorry for saying this, right? We constantly wish that our nice little hobby could, in, could, could accommodate everyone. Because it is nice to bring people together. But look, some people are difficult for some other people. That's it. Not, not everyone gels together nicely. And, and some, some relationships, communicational avenues have a lot of work in the background that either constantly needs to be put in or some boundaries that need to be enforced and reinforced. Now, luckily, I consider myself one of the most privileged DMs out there because I don't feel like I had to deal with a lot of difficult people, at least for me. I guess it's a nice thing to say on the internet. And it's, it's being tested every week, right? Because we constantly talk and overanalyze our environments as players, as co-participators in this shared delusion that the fantasy universe is present. So, all right, it's great. We're talking about our best selves here. But... Let's, let's take it back to step number two. Presenting v viable viewing port windows. And here, I feel like it is... It's starting to be the players and their DMs working together, right? It's the DMs using their innate empathy. Because arguably, look, even the most draconic and hard-rooted dungeon masters out there have this, I feel like you have this knack. We have this thingy where you understand what your players are going through. Sometimes you use it for good. Like, 
and priming certain situations and helping them experience things in a nice, safe headspace. And sometimes you use it for devious means, like manipulating them to a situation or fooling them, taking the rug off from under their feet. That's fine. You know, both of those are... We have this un unspoken contract that when we sit down at a table, that whatever happens at the table stays at the table, but both sides are using, or at least subconsciously, both sides use empathy to their advantage a bit. Now, arguably, this is not a race. So, your advantage as a DM is my advantage as a player and vice versa. Because we both get to experience the things that we both describe. And at the end of the day, if you live as vicariously as you can into your own story's headspace, it's fucking awesome. Are you fucking kidding me? I still remember very fondly player characters, which I could get really angry with, which I could get really sad with, which I could cry with. Equally, the player characters, which finally got their comeuppance a happy ending and were able to experience that side of the emotional spectrum. Because emotion, while some of us don't admit it, or some of us don't feel the need to knack to feel it, is a very integral part of the human experience overall. Now, whatever your emotion might be, that you're tied to, that you feel is more of a cornerstone than others, most of us have one. Most of us perceive something as being of paramount importance, and we're gonna we're gonna integrate that into our expressions, into our tics, into our and ourselves. We're very bad at faking it until we make it. But until then, we're going to put our best foot forward no matter what character it is. So the other side of the table, DMs, we need to be very, very observant for a couple of episodes. Figure out what seems to make someone tick so that we can start experimenting and pull at these strings, see where the ends are, right? Get into someone's head. And once you're there, here's where step number three can start happening. So step number one, right? You define the same space and try to, by definition, cohabit it initially. Then step number two, this is the DMs part. You observe and try to get close to each player's individual headspace so that you can start bridging the gap in between you and them and in between themselves where you might see it fit. Some groups do this very naturally and you as a DM don't have to work extra. Some don't and you have to bridge very varied people together. Both of these cases are very interesting and I'm sure that... Now, these are anecdotal, by the way. I claim no expertise other than years of DMing and interest in these fields. So take, take me with a grain of salt. But hey, what works for us might work for you, and that's why we're making these. So step number two, right, is, is figuring out how people view and experience things, at least at a very base level, because figuring this out deeply for everyone involved might take you know, months, Years, because you're trying to to peer in and, and 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 observe people and learn things from them, and that is a very daunting task. Extremely daunting task. But if you see something that you might be able to work with, here's step number. The next one. Here's step number the next one. Use your words. And keep in mind that perception, and a lot of us forget that because perception is, is tied 
in D and D so much to the visual. Give me a sec. Ugh. These what disgusting sounds that we go through together, you and I. Ugh. Wonderful. Hydration. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> Fuck me, it's been a long week. Right. So, the next and arguably most important and perhaps last, who knows, step is the right descriptors. Because descriptors are in writing, in games, and presentation overall. Is the biggest part of immersion. How you allow things to be experienced sets the tone. So rather than only setting the tone, we're talking about maintaining and, and, and deepening and enriching, enriching, fuck me, the tone of things to come. So take each player, right? Let's take an example player. This man is a fighter, but perhaps has a knight or noble background. Shows a battle master or a champion, something like that. So we're talking about, arguably, an individual which has experienced a palette of the world, has a certain level of education or erudite nature to them, but minimal, right? The first focus is a martial adeptness. So we can start leaning into that. When we find architecture close or even from this player's point of origin, maybe take some moments to describe the texture, describe the height, especially the imposive na nature of a very tall and wide uh, noble structure. Right? A castle for a noble or a very imposing townhouse. A hall for a dwarven lord. These elements are going to be felt by the player who's taken time into considering the fact that he is a noble. But using the right descriptors and the right linkage of elements, right? You do not overly describe anything because he would not look a lot towards objects. A noble would look a lot towards people. The, and even uh, regardless of his higher low charisma, this view of the world is centered not on locations, on highlights of locations, because it is imposing, it is grand, it harkens back to previous experiences, but it would be mostly centered on people. So, maybe as a DM you focus a lot on how he perceives people looking at him, right? A public image worthy of being maintained or not. Maybe you focus on facial expressions of people around him when describing it to that player. Maybe you focus on clothing on people, which might be very important for a knight or a noble. Maybe you focus on the posture of the body, the tension or release in tension, the arching of the back, the gait of someone walking intently versus not. That is still visual, but that is important for a trained combatant because you would naturally be able to perceive more about someone's physicality through posture. Maybe in close scenarios you start describing spell smells. Spells and smells. Like someone's perfume or someone's natural body odor or the small or other auditory and visual tics that you would see someone doing in a very tense social situation which arguably is where you're Limited perception would sink or swim. 
but more than that. Right? This is a very particular example. But more than that, you can branch out. So if you're in a very urban setting, right? These are a couple of bucket examples. If you're in a very urban setting, the city is a character. It should feel lived in. It should feel humming. It should feel crowded. In some places, overcrowded. In some places, markably, marketably, noticeably, bereft of the masses, right? The royal garden should not feel stepped on. It should be pranced with it by a very limited number of guests. So, in this very niche case-by-case scenario, what I'm trying to emphasize is that your descriptions make the place and the people feel alive. So, heights, widths, weights, relative sizes to each other are very important. And I don't even mean describe it in feet and uh, the pounds or whatever. It's weird. I'm Romanian. I should be going kilos and meters, but d and has ruined me. Well, so y- you take it beyond the visual, though, right? Because you describe uh, size and scale and scope for every location. But then the next one, the second most important one, even in our perception, is the auditory. And in the theater of the mind, it's equally important. Describe hum of nature versus the hum of the people, which these two masses are very distinctive, right? People always feel crowded. People always feel moving. People always feel bereft of each other, but somehow keenly aware of a tight pack. But nature feels different. Nature has these moments, these singular metaphorical bells, to and fro, distant echoes, sudden movements. Nature is at the same time supposed to be very auditively relaxed, but uh, tense due to lonesomeness. You're not going to figure out if a thing jumping at you from the bush is a bunny or a wolf until it happens. But until then, both of those beings are going to crack some leaves, are going to shift some branches. You're going to describe very similar sounds. But in prime upon them, different levels of tension. Which is good. You can play around with that tension. That's kind of the, the, the sixth element in all of this. Right? Riding the emotional line with your players and not letting up when you're not supposed to. You're not the one who breaks the tension. They're the ones whose perceptions break the tension when they're supposed to. If not, it's a break in immersion. And we don't like those today. But... So, auditives. I added, fuck me. Auditory inputs. There you go. Those are out of the, let's say if it's if it's 60-40, those are a 20, right? On the scale of how important that sense is in perception. Of course, you're left now with, uh, you know, a, a very strange... modicum of hybridization between the last three because you're going to combine smell and taste invariably because there's only so much you can do with the one without the other right why only describe a very pungent smell if you don't describe the interactions of the odor with the state of nausea or excitement it generates at a sympathetic, parasympathetic level. Whatever you're going to describe in taste and smell is going to gel very well together because these senses in our bodies coexist, especially these two. 
you're not even talking about synesthesia. If you smell a very powerful smell, your taste receptors are also doing something. If you have a very powerful taste in your mouth, it's going to go up into your nose. And if it's spicy, you know, it's going to unclog the shit out of you and make you cry. That's a very particular thing, right? Most of you thought about, you know, the Tabascos when I mentioned that. I'm going to go out on a limb and say you did. I mean, it's very natural. So, you can use all of these. Focus on the five senses. The sixth one, be it narrative tension, right? How intensely, how, how fast of a cadence you have when you're describing things, how... But that is you and priming your storytelling style in the live medium. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go back to the live medium because it only, it doesn't only affect us here. In D and D, the the pulse of events, be it a slow, deep thump, or a fast, nerve-wracking treble, it influences how. Uh, much attention we can afford to give the environment or the things that inhabit the environment versus this this action point view of tunnel vision which can sometimes be detrimental if you're if you're describing very relevant to, to you and to your puzzle and your ideas as a DM very relevant things in the environment the players and they're very focused on a certain detail, overlooking a lot of the details that you want to put forward. But here, I'm going to make a small parenthesis. Adapt to your players. Fuck you. Your baby's not sacred. Fuck you. They don't like your dungeon. Start tweaking the dungeon. It's a nasty thing to say. But you're playing this game with other people and you're describing all of your sacred fucking things to other people. If you don't want to let people climb out of the trolley, maybe this is only a trial run. This is what we can afford ourselves when we're small. I'm, I'm certain that if this ever takes off and we have you know, very personal and defined opinions, we're fucked. <laughs> it's going to be lovely. Anyway, so you, you hone in on the five senses and you, you hone in on, on your importance to them. Maybe for an elf you can divide all of them equally, right? Because perception is very different for elven folk. Maybe for a dwarf, even though they do have dark vision, canonically in D&D, maybe you can focus in more on the tactile and the auditory, right? Maybe you can uh, hone in on these different details on a scale of importance and alertness. But here's, I think, the final je ne sais quoi, but I know exactly quoi it is, that can elevate this from simple locatory uh, and, and sensory descriptors to very personal experience. And that is, it's very weird of me to say it, but I hold a lot of conviction in saying this. Use the right words. Here's why. Barbarian might be very in tune with nature. But even the word soliloquy is going to feel fucking meaningless to this man. He chose to play a barbarian. Now, you might be seeing him go for the noble trope of the noble savage as far as he can push it, but at the end of the day, I'm sorry. Stereotypes and tropes a narrative persona that you can detect exists for a really important reason, and that is, that is the base perception. So lean into those a bit. Use the right words for the right kind of people. And that is race, up to an extent that is class, that might even be background. If someone is very versed in a facet of your world, even though the player is not, if you make him feel like his character is and spoon drip feed him information until until you have it and this was one of the most beautiful things you can have happen as a DM. You spoon feed information to a player. You slowly immerse him 
or her, them, in your world. And at the moment, you're not expecting you get some information echoed back at you. Oh, shit. They remember. They feel it. It's part of them. So focus on the right words that you feel echo well with a class, with a race, with a background, with a person. Because you might have an N20 wisdom played by a really relaxed guy who really doesn't give a shit, again, for the word soliloquy. Or serendipity. Or zippity doo -dah. Fuck cares, right? But for someone like that, maybe you use a lot of intense descriptors and nomers. And maybe your wizard has a vocation, so he really feels the element around destruction. <laughs> Whatever. Family of words and syntaxes and derived intensity, meaning, and perception you use. You should spend a bit of time, if you want a situation, to be felt by a certain person. Tailoring the description just a bit in the back of your mind. Sure, you could do notes about this. I don't know. Uh, to be honest, I don't really do notes. Because I like to work with my players a lot. Now, this might does come back to bite me in the ass. Right? Because uh, the only notes that I do m keep are names of locations and what people did in them. That's it. I don't... I don't like to prepare descriptions on paper because, for me, it feels like I'm cheating. So the solution for me, even though it's very backwards, is to try and experience these locations with my players. If I'm gonna, if I'm gonna describe a new location, I'm gonna focus on, on details that pop out first to the group or to individuals. If I'm describing a very familiar location, maybe I'm going to focus on intricacies each, each time. Different intricacies, different snaps of this snapshot of, of life. So the final advice is this. Use your words fully and with focus and with intent. So let's take it back, right? Let's see if we've accomplished what we set out to accomplish today. First step is try to see and work with your players to bridge them into your world and your world with them. Then get a bit of their headspace, see what's important for them as players, uh, then as player characters and try to see if you can thin the barrier in between these two. Then, of course, use your senses and prime it upon their senses. Because no matter what lens we're working with, at the end of the day, we all think of experiencing the world in a very human way. And we can use that. And the last step, I feel, is the thing that brings it home, the customization that is required for each of your players or for very tight-knit groups. Use the right words. Don't overuse the right words. Shy away from words you see bear no impact or bear too much, too intense of an impact or have a weird reaction. Find the right expressionary family that you can put forward and that you can work with. Feels like a filler, doesn't it? But that's about it, right? In a very quaint, short, and drawn out, not as rambly discussion as I thought it'd be. I'll give you that. But that's kind of the baseline that I feel should be consulted. And of course, you can customize this to your own needs and wants, right? That is very relevant that you kind of want to make these work for you in whatever way you see fit. So hopefully, what we've talked about today is going to help raise or maintain 
this childlike wonder and immersion at your table. I sure fucking know it did with my table. With that, though, I think we're going to draw the main part of the show at a close today. But we still got to make some statements and a bit of an announcement or two. So, it's nice to be back. Even though we all know this show is an absolute poop shoot of wild ideas flung at the walls. Some of them work. Some of them are nice. And that's good. Second of all, sorry for missing. We've had an absolutely hell of a week last week. And it's weird to mention because it's going to become more and more relevant. The more this stays up on the internet, but... Yeesh. The realms of high adventure are very weird. And it is it is partly due to our very own perception and, and mistakes in perception that... That shit can sometimes get weird for us here in Average Adventures. But that's that. Third of all... Mm, this is not... I don't want this to be an announcement, but we might try to explore the avenue of streaming or Sunday games. This channel has been long without an actual campaign. And in whatever way or f shape or form, I want to bring a campaign back or a new one. So I don't know if this weekend, but... We're going to try to stream our Sunday games. <laughs> now, bear in mind, this is a very different experience from what you've seen in our first campaign. And it's been a very long while for us. It's been more than three, four months. So it's going to be very different for us as well. Maybe our scope and focus as players, storytellers, enthusiasts has changed. You're going to see a lot of different people because our... Gems of players in our Sunday games are very different from the people we uh, we are on streams, both as you know, like they're different people in persona, both of actually you know different people. So you're gonna see a lot of our, uh, our friends. It's very very weird for me to say that because it's it's breaking down the barrier of of who we are as as people on the internet, as uh, opinionators, as entertainers. And, and who you're going to see at our Sunday tables, both me being much more of a human than I am right now, uh, much less of an egotistical piece of shit, and, and people who don't, who don't really see us through a screen, even though we're playing on Discord, well, that's going to be a, an animal of its own. But yeah, with that being said, and with me fucking craving, needing a bit of coffee in my bloodstream right now. We're gonna put today's events at a close. But first of all, last of all, first, that's next of all, thanks for joining us for yet another really fun and relaxing, at least for me, episode of The Cup of Homebrew. It's great to be back, and hopefully we won't take any hiatuses in the next period. And if you like what we do, no matter where you're watching this from, everything that we like is down below in the description, be it this week's friend and partner, no sponsors yet, just you know, friends and partners, and people we like, be it our other creative avenues that we hold on the internet, right? Our other brands of social media which are still us just posting on other platforms. Be it the ways that we hope you can help us through donations or subscriptions or whatever you can find below, it definitely helps. Wherever you're watching this from, there's a bell icon, there's a subscribe, there's a, if there's anything that you're comfortable with, to click to hear more from us or experience more from us. It also helps us be more with you. And with that last shameless plug of advertising, thank you. Join us later 
either today or during the week, we're going to also be live during the evenings, playing games with you or hanging around. You're hopefully going to see more and more of us as this period continues. And from the darkest timeline, farewell, good luck, and at least for me, see you tomorrow morning. Bring some friends. I want a lot more people with us. All right. Have a good one. See you tomorrow.